Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to another exciting tour with Pretty Gritty Tours. I'm your guide tonight, Chris Stoddinger, and welcome, welcome. So let's let's get into this because tonight is a super exciting one, and we are going to take a look inside Fort Lewis or Joint Base Lewis McCord. And just to dispel <laughs> any expectations you may have about what you're going to see here or there, I'll clarify. To do a virtual tour of this installation in its entirety would be absolutely bananas. There is over a hundred years of military history that have taken place on a huge piece of real estate out there. And to do something so ambitious would be bananas. So I have the intention of doing multiple virtual tours on this topic. But tonight, what I really want to show you guys is the historic markers on post, things that you normally wouldn't get access to unless, of course, you were a member of the military station there or, you know, family living there uh, because security is tight. It's an active military installation. You can't just get on to go tour it whenever you want necessarily. So uh, with the generous help of the wandering historian, who we'll talk about a little bit in a second, I was able to get on to uh, Fort Lewis and actually get to capture a few of these places. And so we're going to get to showcase them tonight so that you get an intimate look inside the fort. Now, if you have questions, it is a live tour. Please let me know. I know for a fact that the Wandering Historian is here tonight in the comment section, and he is truly the, the expert on this topic tonight, as well as I believe we have a couple other uh, military historians here tonight. So we'll check it out. But yeah, Feel free to comment, join along, and we are going to dive into really one of the most exciting and important places in the Pacific Northwest, very much so in this sort of hyper-local region out here. So uh, yeah, let me double check the comments, make sure everyone's looking good. All right, all right. Let's take a look. Fort Lewis. So again, none of this would have been possible without the incredibly generous, kind, and wise support of the Wandering Historian. Please check him out here. Evan is a wing historian for um, McCord Airfield Air Base, and he escorted me around and showed me where a lot of these historic markers and static displays are, and then together we sort of wove through everything along the way, which actually brings me to my my next thank you, which is, of course, the Lewis Army Museum. Uh, I've worked closely with them for a few years now, and they have been an invaluable resource for the military history in the Pacific Northwest and not surprisingly Fort Lewis. But if you have an opportunity, go check out The Wandering Historian on Facebook or Instagram. You will not be disappointed. He does this awesome Today in History, which every day he posts something new about what happened that day in history. It's if I'm not mistaken, always with a military lens, fittingly enough, but totally awesome. And of course, the Lewis Army Museum is remarkable. It is free and it does have civilian access. So it is on Fort Lewis property. But if you go the back way, there is a sort of, uh, what am I thinking, like chain link lot that you can drive into. You can call the number on the sign and then... Uh, a uniformed soldier will come out and escort you to the museum. And I'm failing on their hours right now, but guess what? It's online. So, so are you right now. You can figure it out. Uh, but both of these were tremendous resources for me going through this here, but let's actually talk about what's, what's going on with Fort Lewis anyhow, because it is currently called joint base Lewis McCords because since 2010, it has been a joint organization. But Fort Lewis originally opened in 1917 as Camp Lewis on what is the Nisqually Plain, just south of uh, Tacoma there. And then to give you some context at the time, 1916, 1917, everyone's kind of gearing up, getting ready for what we think is going to be U.S. in World War I. And there's a huge amount of like, publicity and patriotism swelling around the area. And so there was a vote for the people of Washington, Pierce County area 
to essentially sell two million in bonds to buy the seventy thousand acres of land out there and then donate it to the U.S. government as a military site, and it would just be given as a gift, with the understanding that the the camp that seventy thousand acres would then be released back to the people if it ever stopped being used as a military installation. And so pictured here is Mr. Blitz. Well, this is the guy that Mr. Blitz, uh, sort of the the tip of the spear for this ground swelling movement of patriotism, hires to drive around on his, I believe it's a burro, and his two-wheeled cart. And then they would have this sign and they would just constantly be advertising this idea that there should be a bond to get people out there. It passes. They end up purchasing the land, donating it, and then in just a record amount of time, I think um, construction at American Lake site began on June 15th. And then by July 18th, 1917, that's this very short period of time there, uh, they open. They build some outrageous amount of structures out there. They are ready for action almost instantly. And if I'm not mistaken, it was at the time the quickest built at the lowest under budget military installation at the time. And it is named after Meriwether Lewis, of course, part of the Lewis and Clark expedition. And it opens officially on September 5th, 1917. And it is the first military installation to be created solely as an outright gift of land by American citizens. Pretty sweet. And of course, pictured here are the main, uh, the main gate of Fort Lewis. It was built also in 1917, and they used local materials. And what's pretty extraordinary about that is it looks like river rock, but it's rock that was just excavated from the site as they were building the camp out there. And it's it's an homage to what was that Nisqually Plain beforehand. That is an area that was flattened by glacial recession, leaving behind a lot of that smooth what looks like river rock, essentially, those pebbles that got kicked out of the back of a glacier. And so it ended up being a perfect building material for the Liberty Gate there, which is still there today. It's not in its original location, but it is still there. And then to undertake this feat, just to give you a little more context, I think it was something like just over 10,000 uh, carpenters, laborers, uh, brick layers, masons, surveyors, and they come in and they build plumb and wire 1,757 buildings in essentially three months at a cost of, believe it or not, $7 million, <laughs> uh, which I believe was uh, construction cost per soldier, 142. So again, least expensive at the time. And absolutely the fastest. It has everything that you need on a camp. It has uh, military base offices, medical facilities, mess halls, horse stables, two-story barracks houses, uh, and they build it for the capacity of, if I'm not mistaken, 44,685 soldiers. And they even managed to raise an additional sum, uh, about $40,000 to build that Liberty Gate there. So it was a uh, it was really intensely impressive, honestly. Uh, this is the Liberty Gate today. And as of today, if you look at the entirety of Joint Base lewis McCord, it is officially 4,307 or 4,000. Let me just start over. 413,714 acres. That's a mouthful which uh, that's 90,283 acres actually at joint base, the additional 323,000, good Lord, acres are actually out at the Yakima training facility. For those of you who have gone through Eastern Washington uh, and then down towards like the Tri-Cities, you've no doubt passed that massive uh, 300 plus thousand acre military facility out there. That is officially part of the Joint Base Lewis McCord area, but the 90,000 acres that comprise the, the McCord Lewis entity are what are out here. And originally that was 77,000 acres out there. So whew, 
A lot of information for you all at once, but look at this beauty right here. What you'll notice, uh, because they are quite shiny, are the brass uh, plated cannons out there. Those are not original to the fort. Those were brought out later. But this is the original um, gate here. And that rock had to be disassembled and then the entire gate moved to make way for the much, much, I guess, more advanced gates and checkpoints that they have today. But also of interest, the architect, the same architect that did the Davenport Hotel in Spokane for my history people, uh, uh, Kirtland Cutter, actually designed this military gate as well. He went from like luxury houses and hotels in Spokane to doing uh, private residences in Lakewood and then eventually ends up doing the gate for Camp Lewis. And yes, we've we've already got good information from the wandering historian. I knew he would have tons of information for you guys. Uh, but yes, it is one of the top five largest military installations in the United States today. And certainly one of the most uh, influential and active. And what makes it so great, I mean, there's a ton of things. But one of the things that really sets it apart is that you have access to just a tremendous variety of terrains for training. Uh, you've got prairie, you've got wetland, you've got rainforest, you've got mountain, you've got highland desert. Between all of the different sort of biomes and terrains that you have access to, you can train for pretty much every type of combat that you're going to see around the world. So Joint Base Lewis McCord has been very influential in a training facility, just being able to actually give that real life experience on different terrains out there, making it one of the most um, desirable locations. Not to mention, uh, from those that I know who have been stationed there, it is definitely one of the most enviable locations. It is quite nice being out in the Pacific Northwest, and people often come back here when they're done with their military careers. Now, here's a little look at the facility in the early days, and you can see sort of the map up there on the top right as far as the 77,000 acres that it originally comprised. It has expanded a little bit over time. But if you're super clever, you may notice on the upper left-hand section of this map here an area called Amusement Park, which for those of you who are curious, it's exactly what it sounds like. It was designed uh, as an amusement center for the soldiers because um, soldiers are wont to wander at times. And immediately after the construction of Camp Lewis, uh, a little seedy area pictured here shows up right outside of the gates. And Seattle has already established a reputation in 1917 as being a <laughs> nasty place to go do whatever you want to do. And so to discourage soldiers from spending their time on vice, this amusement center, um, Green Park, named in honor of the camp's commanding general, Henry Green, is opened by February of 1918, right after the camp's construction, and has all sorts of like good things that you can do. Ski ball, shooting gallery, baseball diamond. Uh, I believe they had bowling out there as well. Ice cream parlor, pretty much any good, clean, wholesome fun. They had a library out there as well. And of course, the Red Shield Inn or hotel, which was a Salvation Army hotel designed to accommodate families of those who were coming to visit soldiers stationed at Camp Lewis. And that is actually the building where the Lewis Army Museum is currently housed. So to still have that historic structure out there and to have it utilized as a structure that teaches history is pretty remarkable. This is a little look at the Joint Base Lewis McCord area today. You can see highlighted in red at the northern section of the fort there. The McCord Air Force Base itself is a very small portion of what is a huge amount of land out there. And it's it's remarkable what all is out there. Not only is it a military installation, but also there are old roads and settlements and towns that got absorbed in that initial purchase of the 70 plus thousand acres out there and remain out there essentially as ghost towns hidden deep within the woods out there and really on your day-to-day 
uh, life on post, you would never encounter any of them. But they remain out there. And in fact, the Washington State Historical Society would love to see a lot of them. So having access to some of the historic treasures on Fort Lewis is pretty remarkable. So I think that gives you the initial rundown of how everything got started. Let me know if you have any questions on there. But um, I also want to kind of give a nod to the, the inaugural division. Uh, the 91st division first arrives at Camp Lewis. They're the, the first division out there and they have intense training because they are immediately going to go see action in France during war, World War I. And uh, the men in 91st Division fought with the 13th Division, um, I believe for a period of there, but the, the 13th Division trained at Camp Lewis while the 91st Division was overseas in France, both in 1918 and 1919. Uh, and then at the end of World War I, there was a moment where it looked like Camp Lewis was going to just be disassembled and forgotten. And because it was such a desirable piece of land, it ends up being transitioned in the 1920s into Fort Lewis. So a camp is a temporary military installation. A fort is a permanent one. And the wise decision was made to change Camp Lewis into Fort Lewis and create a permanent military base out there where people would continue training forever and always, essentially. And good thing that they did because it's a tremendous amount of land and it's, it's a really good piece of it there. When it was used for training for the 91st Division, they did a great deal of these. You can see the trenches that they would dig out here, and they would dig these trenches to train them for combat in World War I in the European theater. And um, just a couple questions we're getting here. <laughs> what What is a, a division and so forth? I'm glad you asked. If I'm not mistaken here again, and the wandering historian can correct me if I skew, I believe a company is typically 100 to 200 soldiers. A battalion is a combat unit of about 500 to 800 soldiers. And then three to five battalions, um, so what, 1,500 to 4,000 soldiers comprise a brigade. And then a division is anywhere from 10,000 to 18,000 soldiers. And most divisions have you know, like three brigades in them, roughly of equal size. If, if I've lost anyone here, don't worry, you're not alone. Uh, and then two or more divisions. And um, so a core is two or more divisions. And that normally has, what, 50,000 to 100,000 soldiers. And then there are, you can go from there on. Like artillery groups are batteries. Uh, cavalry are called troops. So on and so forth. So it can get muddled. But the 91st Division was, I believe just over 40,000 troops, soldiers, uh, that trained out here at Camp Lewis and then were sent overseas to fight in World War I. So here we go. There we go. So again, nebulous, but I feel like that should give some context there. So thank you. <laughs> so let's take a look actually inside here. I, I feel like I've given those who are new to the area, a little bit of rundown. Also, just a quick look um, after it opens as Fort Lewis uh, <clears throat> and gets redesignated. There's the addition of the Army Air Corps in 1938, uh, and the Army Air Corps field was approved as a 1,800 acre facility just north of Fort Lewis. Uh, which again, Pierce County transferred to the War Department. And then this was later named McCord Field in 1940 in honor of Colonel William McCord, uh, who had actually been killed in an aviation accident himself in 1937. Uh, it was independent from Fort Lewis in 1947 and then was renamed McCord Air Force Base following the creation of the U.S. Air Force. And then again in 2010 becomes part of the joint facility Joint Base Lewis McCord. And today they are, I think, most famous for this beauty right here. You've no doubt seen them or at least 
heard them cruising around the C-17, the pride and joy of McCord. Uh, I believe there are almost 50 or just over 50. I don't know specifically. I'm not privy to the intel. But uh, C-17 Globemaster three aircraft out there. And yeah, once you live in the area, you forget that they're around. You don't hear them anymore until you're like on a phone call with someone and suddenly you can't hear the person on the other end of the line. You're like, oh, yeah, there's a C-17 directly above me. That's why I can't hear anything right now. But these are extremely active and are responsible for a lot of, of military operations throughout the world. But let's talk about the actual markers themselves. So right as you approach the visitor center and the main gate of Fort Lewis, you're going to encounter the first one. This is Captain Meriwether Lewis Memorial Park. And it is a tribute to the namesake of Fort Lewis, Captain Meriwether Lewis, and his dog, Seaman. Uh, it is a public access park. You don't have to actually enter Fort Lewis to get access to this. You can drive up to the visitor center park and then go visit this park. And it's pretty cool too, because it also um, features this gentleman here who was, oh, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name right now, but he was uh, an NCO with the Corps of Discovery. I believe he was number three in command. And if I'm Again, not mistaken, this is the first statue of an NCO in the United States. And someone can correct me if I'm wrong on that. But I think that is, I think that's absolutely right. And yeah, here's some uh, good one. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah, um, one of the C-17s did assist with the Afghanistan evacuations. I know uh, Grit City Magazine did some excellent coverage on that of that C-17 coming back home. And I don't know if it was more than one, but certainly the one for sure. Awesome. So let's actually go inside now for the stuff that you can't just go see every day. Here is the memorial to the 91st division. I think it's perhaps one of, if not the most impressive memorial on Fort Lewis. And, um, this one is important because by the fall of 1929, Fort Lewis had enough permanent barracks in place to quarter approximately 1,500 troops, but an army-wide troop ceiling of, I think, just under 120,000 was in effect. And so Fort Lewis manpower would not top, you know, uh, 2,000 until 1937, when the 3rd Infantry Division was going to get some extra support down there. But the 91st Division was the, the main source of pride for a long time there. So they have this memorial constructed for them out here by a local artist pictured right here. And this is positioned right at the uh, western end of the main, main parade ground, uh, what is now Watkins Field. And this is sort of right near... Um, general housings. So the generals uh, and uh, higher ranking officers have their housings sort of in a semicircle around this monument here, which is uh, quite large. And it was donated to the 91st Division Association by Colonel Frank McDermott of Seattle and sculpted by Avard Fairbanks, who was, I believe, at the time, the head of the Division of Fine Arts at the University of Michigan which I haven't figured out what the correlation was with that. I'm not sure how he got the ticket for this, but it was uh, deeded to the U.S. government by the 91st Division Association. And on, I think, May 30th, 1930, it was dedicated at Fort Lewis, arm honoring the 91st Division's multiple achievements in the European theater. And here it is in the mid-1930s. You can see some of those large houses back there. Since that time, the trees in the area have grown up quite large in the background there. Uh, but this is Watkins Field that they're shooting across to get this picture right here. And then you can see, too, the depiction of everything going on here. And I thought it was remarkable because the detail is so intense. But also it depicts uh, a woman here. As serving as a nurse, part of the 91st Division overseas during World War I. And I thought that was pretty, pretty remarkable to have that. 
It is a very cool monument out there. And again, it looks right across Watkins Field, the, the main parade ground there. One of the other things that you'll see pretty much all throughout, I know clocked at least five of these, I believe, are these cannons. And they have some different, different stories. They are by the Liberty Gate. They are also inside near Pershing Circle, but they are very similar to one in Wright Park. If you've seen the Wright Park one in downtown Tacoma, that was actually uh, manufactured in Spain in 1784, very close to this one, which was cast in Spain in 1788 and then was in Havana, Cuba, and then during the Spanish-American War was captured and actually given to the city of Tacoma by Colonel Albert Joab, uh, presented to the mayor at a dedication ceremony in the 1900s. Uh, and in fact, at the time, the battleship USS Iowa was in port uh, here in Tacoma and then fired a sunrise salute from the waterfront and this cannon, not this one specifically, but the one in Wright Park, returned uh, returned fire as a salute. And that's the last time the one in Wright Park was ever fired. But these ones are a little more nebulous as for their information. I've been trying to track it down, but I think it is safe to assume that they would have come from Spanish-American War, captured around the same time. Because the one that we do know about is actually at the main gate. It has this handy little plaque here. And this one was captured at the Battle of Manila in the Philippines, also during the Spanish-American War in 1898. So I think all of the the large cannons, the, the 12-pounders and 24-pounders, were captured during the Spanish-American War and then either put up in Tacoma or placed in front of the Lewis Army Museum or throughout the, the Fort Lewis area. The other thing that you'll see just beyond the Liberty Gate is uh, tributes to the various um, battalions uh, and um, other military units that have been stationed at Fort Lewis over the years. Uh, and so 15th Infantry, I think, is absolutely the one that has the longest list of battle honors underneath. But you can go through these here, and they're all really remarkable. The uh, 91st Aero Squadron was a unit of the Air Service uh, and fought on the Western Front during World War I. And the 91st Division was uh, a part of this whole organization as well. Then uh, 6th Engineer Battalion is there. They have a long list of battle honors as well. Uh, 88th Infantry, so on and so forth. There's a whole like semicircle right at the back of the gate there where you can see each of these. And I don't know specifically what it is that allows you to have one of these plinths erected uh, if how long you have to be at Fort Lewis or if there's another requirement but it is a pretty long list that have their, their sigils back here. Uh, also, you'll notice a few for the ammunition train. I believe there's two here. Uh, there's this one and this one here. And these refer to uh, an element of armies primarily in the 19th century and early 20th century that were responsible for transporting artillery and infantry ammunition for each division from the ammunition refilling point to the area of engagement. Uh, and while in very few instances it would have been a literal train, it mostly referred to manpower creating that train that would convey ammunition from the refilling point to engagement and over and over. Uh, and okay, here we go. Thank you. So founding units of Fort Lewis, which makes sense because they are literal pillars there at the gate. One of the things that you'll see also right just inside here um, is the memorial tree. Now this one was planted by Major General Charles Muir, uh, the United States Army who commanded the 20th Division right here. And now it has become a tradition of planting trees dating back to um, this very first one in 1922 when Brigadier General Charles Muir 
planted the first one. It was a Lawson cypress tree. I think he had two at the time. And near the construction of Camp Lewis's first main gate, then uh, this has continued on throughout the years now. So each tree stands as a monument to the leadership and the memory of the installation's highest ranking military leaders as they leave the base. So after these high ranking military officers leave, they often plant a tree. And in 1991, the an honorary gold general shovel was actually made for this event, pictured here, uh, held by Lieutenant General Gary Valesky uh, of First Corps Commanding General. And then he was planting a tree. I'm trying to think when he planted his tree out here. It was fairly recently uh, that he departed. This is one part of multiple installations of trees throughout Fort Lewis. Another really good example is the Fort Lewis Memorial Arboretum. And for this one, you don't have to be a high ranking officer leaving. Each of these trees has been planted for different reasons, but each of them is a memorial tree. And each of them has a, a tag on it, which could be honestly its own virtual experience throughout. But it's um, a beautiful part of Fort Lewis and this Memorial Arboretum actually extends a very long distance and creates this peaceful little grove right on the edge, basically where I-5 intersects with the, the main gate into Fort Lewis. All that southbound section there is Memorial Grove extended on down through there. And it is adjacent to this beauty right here which is the first fuel station on Fort Lewis. And I do not have the exact year that this con was constructed, but I believe it would be safe to assume 1917 because it is constructed with those same uh, glacial rocks that you see with the, the main gate. And again, this was just salvaged material. As they were constructing the fort out there, they went out, picked this up off the ground, and then used it to build. Another memorial that a lot, a lot of people would get to see inside here is, of course, the memorial for John Pershing. If uh, you're not familiar, General of the Armies, John Blackjack Pershing. And it is a pretty simple monument for such a massive figure without there. But he's the only army officer to have the title General of the Armies rather than General of the Army. And he uh, was instrumental in the establishment of First Corps in France in January 1918. And then, I mean, has a massive military history dating through his entire career there. Uh, but for, for such a massive figure in the military history, it's a surprisingly small monument. I think it would have been easy to miss, but it is right in the middle of sort of a little circle kind of at the more historic and older portion of Fort Lewis. Another one that I think most people are familiar with right here is right inside. So right after you drive inside the, the main gate, you get to Iron Mike here, which is an 18 foot bronzed fiberglass statue and is a nod to the infantry soldier and the contributions that the infantry has made in American history. And this guy was unveiled in 1964 as a memorial to the men of the 4th Infantry Division who trained at Fort Lewis before being deployed in Vietnam. And one of the things that's interesting about this particular memorial is that the, the face of the sculpture was designed specifically to incorporate features of all races so as to represent as accurately as possible every infantry soldier at the time. And it was also uh, designed and sculpted by two soldiers who served in the 4th Infantry Division, Juan Guerrero and Pekka Capui. And so this is right at that main intersection uh, as you come inside Fort Lewis there. And here we go. I got some good information on the First gas station. Thank you, sir. 1918 to 1920. And again, yeah, uh, it's been difficult to actually track down the accurate information on that. It is an abandoned structure at this point. I think it's just uh, sort of wallowing out there. 
but needless to say it's a cool thing to have out there and i'm glad that they've got that rock and the historic architecture still around so one of the more somber and impressive memorials out there is of course memorial park uh, this isn't far from uh, core headquarters and watkins field uh, and is next to for those of you who live on on fort lewis the broadmoor neighborhood and it's approximately four acres of land that was set aside to honor soldiers who have died since 9-11 and offers a place of honor, contemplation, and reflection, honestly. Um, there are quite a number of monuments out there honoring combat brigades uh, that lost soldiers in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so I believe uh, this was, I'm trying to remember which which of the memorials opened first, but it was dedicated um, specifically again to honor the soldiers that have died since 9-11 and now has at least two memorials honoring soldiers from striker brigades. First striker brigade, 25th infantry division that deployed to Iraq. Uh, it commemorates the soldiers lost then. And the second memorial honors 42 soldiers from the fourth striker brigade 2nd Infantry Division, which also deployed to Iraq. And it's uh, it's designed as a loop, essentially. You can wander throughout there, and then they've put these reflective memorials throughout, which have tributes to comrades who have been lost. One of the ones I thought was most visually striking is here. And what I liked about this one was that they designed it so that the boot prints fade off into eternity as you move in between the two memorials down there. It was a, um, I don't know, it was a somber moment to be out there for this one and to remember the sacrifices that have been made, especially because touring the facility, so many of the memorials that we got to interact with have the distance of time to them. But this was certainly one of the ones that has taken place most recently. Um, and there's definitely something, I don't know, more raw about it. Moving farther back in time, though, is uh, the historic cemetery, which was first part of Camp Lewis and then part of Fort Lewis. And while this only has a few remaining plots on it, um, it is still an active cemetery. There are very high standards to get buried out here now. But the first headstone ever to be placed in the cemetery uh, is so so old that it isn't even marked with a date. Uh, it belonged to a soldier, Lee Whalen, a soldier who was training at Camp Lewis in 1917 uh, and died in October before seeing action uh, from a brief illness that I don't even know that they diagnosed. Um, <laughs> And yeah, it, it will tell you his name. And that's basically it, that he belonged to Company B of the 347th Machine Gun Company, but not much else. Uh, the records you have to go back to to get more information on that. But uh, there are also other more high profile residents of this particular cemetery, including Major General David Stone, who is the man who came to Washington in May of 1917 with the orders to find a location to build a national army camp. And there's a whole story to that, which, again, we have to save for a different virtual tour of the difference between, you know, National Army, Army of the United States, the transition from states militias being organized and incorporated into a national army that trained the same way with the same uniforms. It's it's a whole story. And again, we really just only have time for so much tonight. So I'm going to do my best for you. Um, going through the cemetery there was so much to take in, but again, one of the, the more shocking and deep moments was there's an entire section of infants or young children that died during um, the, the Spanish influenza epidemic in the 1918 period there. And it's, it's almost an entire corner of the cemetery out there. But there's approximately 1,000 souls uh, who have been committed to the cemetery out here on 
Fort Lewis, and it's uh, as old as the installation itself. Like I said, it's basically closed. You aren't going to see many active burials out there. I think there's uh, space for three or four cremation plots, and it's a very high bar to get in there. Um, but you'd have to have some significance, I think, to the Fort Lewis uh, installation to be buried out there, or possibly of a close tie to family. Uh, and most of the burials don't take place out there at all. They they happen at different installations throughout the area. But some really remarkable stories out there, and I hope to do an entire piece just on the stories of those who have been buried in the cemetery out there, because there are some really remarkable stories of those. So let's take a quick trip really quick because we have limited time, but I do want to briefly introduce you to some of the markers just across the way at McCord Air Force Base. Uh, and this is Unity Bridge. This is really important because before 2015, you, even though, how do I say this? McCord Air Force Base was its own installation. It becomes part of Joint Base Lewis McCord in 2010, but for five years, you had to exit <laughs> Fort Lewis, go on I-5, and then re-enter McCord Air Force Base or vice versa if you needed to go between the two. And eventually someone was like, we have to do something. This is bad for civilian traffic. It is bad for military traffic. It is non-efficient. We need a solution. And what was decided was Unity Bridge opened in May of 2015, and it connects the two previously unconnected sides of Joint Base Lewis McCord and goes over uh, what was then called Perimeter Road. I actually think it might still be called Perimeter Road. It bisects the base uh, and is still used for military transportation underneath Unity Bridge. But if you're gonna get from one side of JBLM to the other, you take Unity Bridge here. Uh, here's a little uh, plaque describing it, which I thought was hilarious because it is in the middle of the bridge, uh, which as you can see here, isn't exactly uh, the safest place. There's not like a sidewalk. There's just sort of a little shoulder off on the edge there. So you can screenshot this later if you want. It's a safer way to get information about it. But what I thought was great about the the McCord military history installation is that they have one of the coolest air parks I've ever seen right out uh, next to the main airstrip. And it has this beauty right here, which became important to me because uh, in in the early days of the military out here, there were 15 B-18 bombers and 21 A-17A fighters that gave a civilian and military audience of 3,000 people a like jarring demonstration of the destructive capabilities of modern air power. Now, you want to see something cool? Watch this. So they drop live ordnance from these warplanes, over 400 bombs on a mock city, completely wiping it off of the map. Unfortunately, there were no cameras allowed at this particular demonstration, so um, we don't have anything to show you as far as what it was. But if you remember the map at the beginning of our tour, at the very southern part of the JBLM installation, there is a little place just labeled Mock City, and it is exactly what it sounds like. They use this uh, to construct different things and then wipe it off the map before rebuilding it. But it is an active training ground. And in the early 1900s, it was the spot where just to, to show people where their money was going, a crowd of 3,000 assembled. And then these beauties right here went and just dropped 400 live ordnance down on Mock City, erasing it from history forever. Uh, and today, it's still there. You can actually see taking off just at the tail of this beauty, uh, a C-17 doing maneuvers out there. But the flight park uh, tries to showcase all of the aircraft that have played some role in the McCord history out here. Each of them has a little plinth in it that kind of talks about what's going on and all of it is underscored by the 
the thunderous engines of the C-17s taking off and landing just on the other side out there. Uh, this is a plane that I have just recently fallen in love with, thanks to the wandering historian, the A-10 Warthog, which uh, is, once I started doing research on it, basically like the most beloved airplane of infantry throughout the U.S. And it's a low altitude, close air support aircraft. Uh, the A-10 has, if you can see in this picture here, a GAU-8 Avenger 30 millimeter Gatling gun mounted on the nose. And this is designed to be called in as air support, fly low, and then do a strafing flight where it can fire, I don't even know how many armor piercing, uh, uranium, high explosive, incendiary, whatever you want rounds uh, with incredible maneuverability at very low altitudes and very low airspeed. And it sounds awesome. <laughs> when the tour is done, I want you guys to go to YouTube and look up the A-10 Warthog. Uh, it is really, really a cool airplane. Uh, and it's it's amazing to me that the air park is out here because it has such cool aircraft, really well maintained, prominently displayed. And if you are lucky enough to be a guest out there, you get to go see um, these. Also, uh, one of the coolest planes out there is this beauty right here. This is actually... Um, one of the F-16s that was flying and was engaged in, I believe this one was protecting the Pentagon on 9-11. And after it was decommissioned, it was given as a static display here at McCord Air Force Base, where if, again, you're on the installation, you get to see it today, right next to um, Heritage Hill out here. And Heritage Hill is a, a pretty remarkable part of the Tacoma's history because the, the airstrip out there was an independent donation. Tacoma decided after the establishment of Camp Lewis that they wanted to essentially buy up more land and then donate it again as an airstrip, which then later gets donated to become what is now the McCord Airfield. So all of this space out here, um, which now comprises the 90,000 acres of Joint Base Lewis-McCord, was donated land by citizens of Pierce County and reflects very highly on the patriotism and pride of all the people out there. So uh, I can only sing the praises of it enough. Now, McCord also has its own um, very heavy memorial tribute out here. Uh, memorial Grove has several um, memorials out here, uh, including this one, which I'll show you here in a second, titled To Live. And it is a, a bronze statue dedicated to POWs. And I think this was absolutely the most, I don't know, uh, I can't even think of the word. It just impactful for me. Um, but it's um, just inside the, the main gate to McCord Field. And the grove itself is just slightly smaller than the Memorial Park over on the Fort Lewis side at three acres. And it's a site where people can pay tribute to the airmen who have come before them and those who continue to serve today. Uh, and yeah, so this is the POW MIA Memorial Plaza. And there's an airlift plaza and an NCO plaza as well. And again, as the name Grove implies, there are several memorial trees as well that have been planted out here. Uh, the Airlift Plaza is also, I think, one of the most interesting ones out there because it has replica models on top of these uh, concrete columns of every uh, airplane that has been uh, a major part of the installation out there. So they've got the C-54 Skymaster, the C-124 Globemaster II, the C-17 Globemaster III, of course, uh, the C-130 Hercules, the C-141 Starlifter, and a C-82 um, packet line, or a packet. And they're all there in that main plaza. And each one has little bricks installed in the ground down there, which I sadly don't 
have I have a picture of it, but I don't have it loaded up for you guys of uh, airmen who have served on those particular aircraft and they try to group those um, together. So it is a, a really remarkable and moving part of the entire installation out there. So glad to have it. Now, uh, since we're talking about the fact that this is donated land, I do want to share with you just a fun, fun story briefly of a, a Tacoma airman named Harold Bromley. Harold Bromley was, uh, he was an aviation genius. He trained a lot of famous pilots throughout time, including, I believe, Amelia Earhart. He was born in British Columbia, and then he was just this charming dude who decided that he should be the first person to fly a single engine plane across the Pacific Ocean from Tacoma to Tokyo. And he was charming enough that he convinced people to buy into this plan. So he raises $25,000 in 1929 to essentially fund his expedition across the Pacific. And it's, it's a sweet plane that he comes up with. But he keeps getting um, so many problems. One of the biggest problems that he has is that he doesn't have enough um, essentially speed or velocity to get up and over his first obstacle. So he designs this ramp, right? And he puts the plane at the top of the ramp, fires up the engine. He's going to launch the sucker down the ramp, lead it off. He's going to go out across the Pacific, but tragedy strikes. And one of the, the gas lines blows. He's blinded. He doesn't course correct in time. And the plane flies off, goes about 1,500 feet and crashes right in front of this huge audience who had gathered to see, see him go across in the city of Tacoma. Trust me, I have so many mixed feelings about the fact that this beauty was named the city of Tacoma. But undeterred, Bromley tries again, not once, not twice, but I believe three times taking off from what is now McCord Field, trying to launch his expedition across the Pacific, Tacoma to Tokyo. And unfortunately, he never makes it. He crashes every single time uh, to the point now where I'm told that airmen who screw things up, they're like, ah, bromley that. So now you know, my friends, Next time you're flying anything, whether it's an air-sea airplane or a paper airplane, just remember, don't Bromley it out there. It's good to have high hopes, but you gotta, you got to have a little bit of extra luck on your side. Because again, the dude was an accomplished pilot. He just couldn't get it to take flight. So with that, I think that's our perfect introduction. So moving forward, I've got some really great stuff for you guys. I'm going to do a separate thing just on the history of McCord and what is going on there. We're going to do a separate thing on uh, Camp Murray and the the State Guard, not, not the Washington State National Guard, the State Guard, my friends. And we're also going to be doing one whole thing just on Washington State historical markers, just important to the state of Washington, located in and around the area there. So stay tuned. We've got a lot going on. But if you enjoyed your tour tonight and you'd like to show your appreciation, you can always tip your guide with this bad boy right here. You can always go to the homepage of prettygrittytours.com. Again, that's prettygrittytours.com and tip your guide. All of your uh, support is appreciated, not necessary, but appreciated. And please go and check out uh, The Wandering Historian. He has so much great stuff. And again, I couldn't have done this tour without him. So please make sure you check him out and see what happened today in history. If you guys have questions or comments, please let me know. I'm happy to, to do my best to answer them. And I believe Evan will be around to answer questions in greater depth and detail. But I really appreciate you guys sticking around for tonight's tour. I'm excited for the next one. And until then, keep on exploring.